God, I just want to thank the Lord uh, for, for him showing up this morning. I've been praying that way. I just believe when the Holy Spirit shows up, it's amazing what God will do in our heart and in our life. While we were worshiping, I will say this. I don't want to go on and on. I, got a lot. I want to try to get through this message this morning. But some of the songs we were singing, I don't even remember exactly the words to the second to last song, but it was talking about the name of Jesus and it talked about victory. And then um, we were thanking Jesus. And really and truly, even to some of the young people in the house right now, but this is really for everybody. You know, but specifically for young people, just because y'all are y'all are pulled in so many directions uh, by the world that's around you. Um, because you know, you go out into the into you go to school, uh, and you're and you're around a lot of people maybe that that don't believe in the Bible, don't believe in the Word of God. It's becoming less and less as each day goes by that uh, the world is influencing society and there's less people that believe in the Bible and the Jesus of the Bible. Um, and you know, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of influence in society to cause people to go in a certain direction. And I was just wondering while we were singing, and I know that the Holy Spirit was ministering to my heart. Uh, and, and, you know, because, you know, we all have things that we go through. And as, uh, and, you know, Bill and I were talking yesterday about, we have, we're going to have a Bible study tonight, by the way, to be going on praise and worship. And we were talking about praise and worship. And we were talking about how, you know, when you begin to praise and you begin to magnify the Lord, that the Lord will reciprocate. Like when you give him glory and you extol his name and you magnify his name, he reciprocates. And what that means is he responds and he begins to change the atmosphere and he begins to change. See, many times, I got to be honest with you, I sometimes I'm tired. Like, I'll just be honest with you. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. This is not what this is about. I'm just trying to make a point. I worked till midnight last night. I stopped at the church and I prayed. I didn't get that much sleep. And I'm tired, but I expect to be tired because that's what that's what happens when you work till midnight and you get up in the morning. But one of the things that I've learned through a process of time is, is that if I will begin to elevate the name yes. of Jesus, yes. if I will begin to magnify him, that even though I'm physically tired, the Holy Spirit will show up and he will begin to change my atmosphere. Yes. Even if I'm going through some things, some heaviness, because listen, we're all going through some things, right? I know you are because I know I am. And But even when we're going through those things, if we'll begin to magnify the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, he will respond and, he, and the atmosphere will begin to be changed. And so I want to encourage you with that because what is it that you normally do whenever you feel down? Because people have things that they go to, right? And I'm not going to sit here and list off a bunch of lists because I'm not trying to, trying to do that right now. I'm just trying to say you can think in your heart and in your mind the things that you typically have done in the past when you're feeling down and the things that you're running to. Whatever those are. No, really. I mean, anything that provides an alternate reality or a place of escape from the real world would fit into the blank. I'm telling you, anything from anything from uh, from video games, yeah, right? Something that simple, right? And then Lord only knows what you're putting in you when you get into the video game. I, I have to do it. It's just reality. Is that bad? Am I bad guy for doing that? No, of course I'm not. I'm telling you the truth, right? Uh, but there's other things people will go to. They'll go to various types of medicines. They'll go to, you know, whatever the case. Are you telling me don't take my medicine? That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to make a point. That we're going, we're being told by society to go to all kinds of different directions Amen. and to Amen. embrace all types of things in order to help our pain and our problems. And what I'm trying to tell you is, have you ever tried Jesus? No, you know what I'm saying? Like we did it this morning together. And I don't know if you felt what I felt, but I felt the atmosphere Amen. in my life and in this place. Yes. And I'm just thinking to myself. If I was at home and I felt down, mm. what would happen mm. if I, I dare you right, right. to download an app that has Christian music on it, yeah. worship music, yeah. praise music? I challenge you to do that, my friend. And then I challenge you this, that the next time you feel down, mm. come on, somebody. Can I share a little story with you? The other day I was at the pediatric clinic. And this young girl's mama said, she's such a good artist. 
Now you, I don't know how. You can't make this stuff. <laughs> my mama says she's such a good artist. And you know me, I have a problem keeping my mouth shut. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so she shows me, baby, show him some of your stuff. Dude, this girl can draw, she can paint. She picks her favorite one. And it's got a female angel with these wings. And it says Lucifer. Oh. Oh. And then she's got all this other stuff in there. And it's just, and the, and the way it looks, it's so, so pretty. And it's so calm. She's also got like some little anime stuff that she draws. She's got all these little things. And I couldn't help myself. I said, my name's Pastor Matt. <laughs> because she also had like a little thing about Lilith in there. You see, and the thing of it is, is this, is that I've been studying this stuff. And so what am I supposed to do? Just be quiet about it? Right. And so I said, well, my name's Pastor Matt. And I see where you're going with this. And I see where you're going with that. And I've studied the other side. And I'm on the other team. Now, I mean, is she saying she's on? She's only 17. But, but, but what has she indoctrinated herself with, church? Right. No, no, really. Like, you think that a 17-year-old girl that has a brain that can produce artistic work like that is not of extremely highly intelligence? Yeah. Yeah. No, she is. She is, and she knows what she's learning, and she's indoctrinating herself, and she's actually buying it. Now, she's deceived. Absolutely. She's deceived, but she's in it. And so when she goes and she feels, what do you think she does? She produces more work like that. And what is the world that people are living in whenever they're going through things? What kind of stuff are they exposing themselves to? What kind of stuff are they digging into? I'm just trying to encourage it to let you know. I remember what it was like as a teenager. I know what I was getting into and it was no good. But now that I know Jesus, I just want to encourage you, whether you're young, whether you're old, whoever you are, wherever you are, please get some worship music up in your phone. And the next time you're feeling down, instead of going to the day that you used to go, give Jesus a try. And, but, you know, I tried it. No, you know, you, you tried it for three minutes in one song. We got to learn, church, how to push through. We got to learn, church, how even to break through. We got to learn how to call on the Lord, amen, and to let him move in our life. Amen. Well, praise God. I titled my message this morning, Armor One. You ready? Because it's going to be an Armor Two. Let's read, starting in verse 10. It says, this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Ephesian church. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of of the devil. I probably won't get back to it, or maybe I will, but you know the word wiles means schemes and trickery. I love to talk about it all the time, but it's getting old because the cartoon's old, but wild E coyote in the road runner. That's what it means. He always had tricks. He always had traps. He was always trying to snare the road runner. This is what the word means. It means schemes, traps, trickery, devices. One word means cunning arts. He's cunning and he has tricks and he deceives. He's good at what he does, my friend. Yes, yes he is. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, on the surface, in the evil day, you may think in your mind that this is talking about in the day when evil really shows up. Maybe whenever the Antichrist comes on the scene or whatever, whatever, if you know somebody's still here. But in reality, the idea is, is that whenever evil shows up on your day. Whenever that day is and evil shows up on that day and he begins to attack you, you need to be prepared to know how to combat and to deal with what's going on. He says, 
He says, the whole of our God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Mm. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication of the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. You know that means he was in prison. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Praise God. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your glorious word. Lord, your word is communicating your heart to your people. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help me to communicate this word the way that you desire it to be communicated, Lord. Now pray that there'd be a whole lot less of that and a whole lot more of you. Holy Spirit, what we really need is a move of your spirit. We need a move of your presence. We need you, great teacher and preacher, to reveal the truth of your word to your people so that your people can be strengthened and that you would minister to them in the powerful name of Jesus. Armor one. Amen. So the Ephesians text says that we're in a wrestling match. The Corinthian letter says that we're in a war. You know, it's not a typical scene that you would see where people are dressed up in soldier armor and that they're actually wrestling because the scripture talks about a wrestling match in this passage of scripture. It's not that that's not what people do like back in the ancient days. They didn't put all this armor on to get into an actual grappling match where they'd be rolling around on the ground. That's not the idea. The idea, though, is this, is that we're in a wrestling match because it's talking about the pro close proximity of the battle that we're involved in. We're in a battle with principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It's right here amongst us. This, this, this word that we just read, the Apostle Paul, I don't know what the rest of the world is thinking, but the Apostle Paul wants, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul wants God's people to know that you are in a war, that you are in a wrestling match with, dark, with the forces of darkness. And that they they desire to attack you. So we're in a wrestling match, and in the, in the Corinthian letter says we're in a war. I want you to know that the effectiveness of Satan's strategy it all hinges on lies and deception. If people would gain access to the Word of God, <laughs> grab a hold of it, and to believe it, Satan's grapple holds are broken, and his aerial assault in the spirit realm loses its power. Amen. But if he can get people, especially God's people, to believe his lies, he gains a foothold and penetrates the fortress that God promises in his word. God does say in his word, does he not, that he is our refuge, our strong tower, our ever-present help in our time of need. Hallelujah. Yes, that's what he says. And is God a man that he should lie? No, he is not. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. That's what his word says. So when we find ourselves in the midst of darkness, when we find ourselves being attacked, and we feel the spirit of heaviness upon us, what we need to come to the realization is that is a lie. That is a feeling. Because the word of God says that, hallelujah, that the joy comes in the morning. That if I will begin to praise the Lord, if I will begin to call upon the Lord, the Lord will change the atmosphere. He will begin to move. I'm tired of believing the lies of the devil. I want you to get tired of believing the lies of the devil. You and I as the children of God need to start to learn and to believe what the word of God says. Yes, the enemy's coming against you. Yes, he's trying to attack you. Yes, he's trying to get in your head. That's what he does. He'll never stop it. He is never going to quit. The question is, what are the people of God going to do? Satan plans to take the victory, my friend. His tactics are unrelenting and without a handle on God's word, there is no hope of victory. The Apostle Paul warns in the second letter to the Thessalonians that the last days would see a great falling away. And apostasia is what the Greek word is. It hasn't been fulfilled yet, yet the trailer of the movie 
is projected weekly in Sunday sermons through the release of diluted messages at best and a scripture painted psychology at worst. Prayer to God has been exchanged for plans of man and the word of truth for a message of motivation. Yes. Yeah. Jeremiah warned Israel. He said, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their own direction. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? And when I write these messages, I can hear somebody in the back screaming. Uh, so he's asking, he's saying, what it, what, was he asking his people, what will you do when my long suffering runs out? When the end of mercy arrives? When it's exposed and so many realize they believed the lie and they loved it? And I can hear someone in the back saying, yeah, preacher, but that's Old Testament stuff. Give me some New Testament stuff. You ever heard people say that? Okay, here you go. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. God is going to allow strong delusion and they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And he screams again from the back and he says, but that's talking about the world preacher. And the preacher softly responds, no, it's not. It's talking about those that didn't believe the truth and took pleasure in unrighteousness. See, churches are filled today with people that reject the truth. Churches are filled today. There's been times in each and every one of our lives where we've taken pleasure in unrighteousness. Sometimes tomorrow there might be an opportunity to take pleasure in unrighteousness. God's not okay with his people taking pleasure and unrighteous. And if that be the reason that people don't want to come back next Sunday, I'm not trying to pick a fight. Definitely not with anybody in the crowd. Maybe with a devil or by the grace of God. But if that be the reason that people don't want to come back to a church because the truth be told that people take pleasure in unrighteousness and God's not okay with it. Yeah. Lord, help us. Yes. Help us. Then we see Paul's warning to the church take place before our eyes as people with itching ears depart from the faith and surrender themselves under teachers with seared consciences that speak doctrines of devils. Wow. This is the word of God, church. You understand that? I'm, I'm preaching to you. I'm reading to you. That right there, I didn't reference it, but it's coming straight out of the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. In the last days, mm-hmm. some will depart from the faith. Give heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. They will heed to themselves, preachers, because they have itching ears. The word means to have ears that want to hear pleasant words. I didn't write that. The Holy Spirit wrote it. It's so bad that it's not even a fracture in the armor, but instead there is no armor. God's people are mercilessly thrown onto the battlefield naked every time they leave a church unprepared. I'm not saying every church, you get the point. And without armor, send into the battle without the hope of truth. And I want you to know that every element of this armor is forged in truth because every element of this armor describes Jesus for he is the belt of truth. He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. He is the righteousness. God. The Bible teaches that now the righteousness of God apart from the law has been revealed. His name is Jesus. Praise God. He's the king of righteousness. That's right. Amen. He is the preparation of peace. The Bible teaches in Isaiah chapter 9 that he is the prince of peace. He's the helmet of salvation because the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 2 that he's the captain of our salvation. He is the sword of the spirit because the word of God says in Revelation 19, he's clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. Out of his mouth protrudes a two-edged sword with which he will smite the nation. Oh, hallelujah, the word of God. He has the sword of the spirit. Hallelujah. And the word of God says that I am clothed in him. What does that mean? It means that I'm in him. How did that happen? It means that I was born the first time like Adam. 
Adam, born into sin, but that when I got born again, are you born again this morning? You need to be born again. You need to invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You can do it right now. You can do it tonight. You can do it at the end of the service. But you just got to do it from your heart. You got to say, Jesus, I want you to live in me. I want you to come inside of me. And I want you to forgive me of my sin. God, I need you. And if you will do that, the Bible teaches that you become born again. And now you're clothed in him. In the mind of God, God sees God's, his people clothed in Jesus. The Apostle Paul is actually in prison. He's actually in house arrest is what it is in, in, in Rome. And, you know, most people believe that that's what he was doing. He was actually looking at a soldier. And he was looking at the armor they were wearing because he writes multiple times. He uses a prepositional phrase in Christ, in him, in whom, meaning that we're now in Jesus. That when we got saved, we were born in Adam. But when we get born again, we're now in Jesus. Does that make sense? And so we're in Christ in the, in the mind of God. When God sees you, he doesn't really see your faults and failures. He sees Jesus, his holiness, his righteousness. Amen. And, and so that's, that's what many people believe that Paul was seeing that. And so now I'm clothed in him. And so now what I want to ask you is this. Who, whose report will we believe? Amen. Will we believe the word of the Lord or will we believe Satan's lies? Amen. Satan's going to sit here and whisper to people and he's going to lie to them and he's going to say, no, you're not. You're not clothed in Christ. No, you're not. You're not righteous because this, 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 and this. But listen to me, saints. You, you and I need to understand. Let me not get ahead of myself. There's a difference between, between the righteousness of Christ being given to us as a gift and our walk with God. Okay, there's a difference, but I got it in here, so let's just keep going. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's just start with the word stand. It says, it says to make firm, to establish a person or thing, to sustain the authority or force of anything. You, God wants to make you be able to stand in the face of the enemy. God, listen, the, Jesus said, said this. Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven and upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of the hell will not prevail against it. That's the word of God. The gates of the hell are trying to open up and hell is trying to breathe on you. It's hot breath and trying to convince you that you can't win. And the word of the Lord says something different. The word of the Lord says that you have victory if you will begin to believe that Christ is the rock, that Christ is the strength, that he is the son of the living God and put our faith in the word. Hallelujah. And watch the Holy Spirit show up and give us the victory. We're wrestling with spiritual entities that want to destroy souls, families, this church, the people we work with. The forces of evil are not hungry, my friend. No, they are hungry for Christian blood. Yes. Amen. Wow. Paul said you can stand because why? You have access to grace. Amen. Praise God. It says in Romans 5 and 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Look, grace from God is forgiveness, but you know what else? It's also power from the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, man. Oh, wow. Praise God. The Holy Spirit. What devil in hell can handle the power of the Holy Spirit? It's the kind of power that makes weak knees strong, sends sick hearts clean, and worried minds filled with songs and joy. It's a miracle working spirit. It's a miracle working power. You can't explain it. And if this preacher could preach it to you and then it just happened, hallelujah, I'd be the happiest man in the world. I'll be crying out, Lord, you got, you got to show up. Holy Spirit, your anointing has to do it. You've got to flip the switch for people because the words of a man are not going to get it done, but this is the word of the living God, and if you'll believe it, hallelujah, if you will believe the word of the living God, it will transform your life. Obviously, the opposite of truth are lies. Can words even describe 
the importance of God's truth in a world bathed in satanic lies. We're being assaulted from every angle by the lies of the world. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge yes. of God, Bring, and bringing into captivity every thought yes. Yes. to the obedience of Christ. If you look up that word imaginations, the, the, the strong Greek dictionary says reasoning that is hostile to the Christian faith. Come on. The world is pumping out to us what it says love is. The world is pumping out to us what it says normal life is. The world is pumping out to us through the airwaves and however it can trying to convince us that this is normal, but the Word of God says something completely different. Unfortunately, if we're honest, I'm, i got to tell you, 12 years as a Christian, I barely really opened the book like I should have. There were times that I would be all sure. I'm trying to encourage you. Come on, preacher, don't know. I'm here to poke you a little bit. I am. I'm here to poke you. Not here just to stroke you, but to, to go ahead and give you a little poke there, buddy, to challenge you a little bit, to get your Word, Get that Bible and open it up, Christian. Right. Open it up and put your eyes on the Word of the living God and let the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you through the Word of God yes. so that it can begin to combat the lies of Satan that are in the midst of this world. Yes, right. You know, the things that half of America is so upset about are not accidental. This is a plan to bring an ever worsening curse on the earth and allow sin to gain more dominance. Because Satan and the fallen angels love filth. I thought about taking this part out of my message because the way I wrote it, it just sounded so gross. But I felt like the Holy Spirit said, no, I don't want you to take it out because I want my people to understand sin is filthy. Mm, that's true. The dirtier it is, the happier demon spirits are. If the dove of the spirit loves a clean bird bath, I talked about that Wednesday night, right? Can you imagine the dove? Because it's a symbol of the spirit. He likes clean environments. He sees a he sees a pristine bird bath down in somebody's yard. He kind of like comes around. He, he dives in there and he's just happy, right? He's splashing around. You see Bert happy and greased down there, get a little sip, throwing some water up. He's happy in that environment. If that's you in our spirit, where we're crying out to the Lord and he's given us grace and victory to walk in righteousness and purity and cleanliness, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit's so happy. He, he wants to be with us. He wants to be there, right? Well, if that's what the Holy Spirit likes, if the dove likes that, then guess what? The raven of the air, they want a rotten, maggot-filled carcass that leaches out into the water, sinful infection and disease. It's pretty gross. That's why I almost took it out, because who wants to hear that on a Sunday morning whenever you hear a preaching and then you're about to go eat? <laughs> but it's reality. You, you know, have you ever thought about this? Because I've been thinking about it a lot. When you watch those movies that you watch, and then there's like wickedness and darkness, even like I say, you know, unfortunately, I watched a couple of vampire movies. I don't recommend it. Don't do it. Don't get caught up in vampire movies. Anyway, let me just keep moving. But next thing you know, they'll show you, or, or a movie with a witch in it. Okay? You got a witch, and she's over there. And I don't mean to over-embellish it, but <laughs> and she's making her witch's brew. And then all of a sudden, the camera will cut to, and there's like a little, a little bug, a roach or something. <laughs> Scurries across. Scorpion. Or there's like a little pit with a bunch of snakes. And they're writhing around. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all know what I'm saying, right? See, the scripture says in Romans chapter 1 that they changed the image of the incorruptible God and turned it into images of foul of the air and creepy thing. A little spider runs across this. Ezekiel, whenever I taught about demonic spirits in the temple or the presence of evil in the temple, what did it say? Son of man, look into the hole. Dig up in the hole, and he went into a corridor, and he went room after room after room, and in the room they had images of creepy things. See, that's that's a sign that they're showing us 
it's, it's deeper and we don't have time to get into it. But the point is, is that it's filth. It's, it's, it's dirty. These are the things that, that the demon spirits are into. And this is the kind of stuff that they want to get us involved in. And when we open ourselves up to those things, we allow an opportunity for evil to come in. Preacher, if I keep coming to this church, I ain't going to be named nothing I'm going to be left to do. Yeah, there's going to be a whole lot of you going to be left to do. You're going to keep on work. You're going to learn how to worship the Lord. Hey, maybe you'll learn how to read the Word of God. You're going to learn how to believe the Word of God. And He's going to begin to change your atmosphere. Hallelujah. The next thing you know, your neurotransmitters are going to be feeling a little bit better bumping around up there. You're going to have a little bit more serotonin, a little bit more dopamine, a little bit more norepinephrine running through your your neurons, your mood's going to be a little bit more elevated. And it won't be because somebody had to write you a script. It'll be because you focus on the Lord. Hallelujah. And the Holy Ghost showed up and He did a work in your life and He lifted off of you that spirit of depression. That's the Holy Spirit, my friend. He will do that for you. Why? Why would He do that for me, preacher? Because He loves you. He loves you. Yes. He said the Father sent Jesus to die for you. That's how much he loves you. Hallelujah. But what will combat the lies? What is the compass to keep us straight in the midst of this sin sick and world? God has given it to us. It is his truth. It is that book right there. Put on your belt of truth, soldier, and let's get going. We've talked about the importance of the liberal belt. I meant to grab my little thing. You know, I've done that before. I'm not going to do it. I don't have to just take my word for it. Where I wrap that sheet around me. You remember that? Because, you know, back in the day, they wore, even the men would wear something kind of like a gown. You know what I'm talking about? And so the belt, so whenever they were going on a journey, okay, what they would do is they would take the under part of the garment and they'd pull it up because it's talking about your loins. All right, and they would tuck it up under that belt and they'd pull it up so that that, that gathering garment underneath that they had to take off running, it wasn't going to trip them up and, and get tangled up in their feet. Okay, does that make sense? So I want you to think about that when you think about the belt of truth. So that literal belt at the level of the loins and how it was associated with travel. Like a flowing garment lies from Satan will trip you up on your journey. You can't run for Jesus if you're swimming in a swamp of lies. Make sense? John, John, Jesus said this, the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and life more abundant. Jesus said this to the religious. This is powerful. Jesus says, you are, are of your father, the devil. Well, he wasn't very seeker sensitive. Though. I guess he didn't really want them people in his church. Either that or they could get right. Right? You can get they can get right. You are of your father the devil, and the loss of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. Yes, he is. God's life is connected to God's truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God gave us this whole book right here, and this book reflects the truth. That is Jesus. And if someone doesn't know it, they can't live it. Amen. If we don't know the word of God, well, there's no way we can live it. So we have to put some work into this. Whenever you read the word of God, hallelujah, and you become familiarized with it, then it makes more sense when the preacher starts preaching. Amen. <laughs> I'm not fussing, but I'm just saying, if I, if I had a nickel. For every time I heard filtered out of someone's mouth in the church through the years or somebody straight up told me, I just don't understand what you're saying. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard that, I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't be rich because it's just a nickel, but <laughs> I'd have like a little bit of change in my pocket, my friend. And all I'm trying to say is, yeah, because like it's a foreign language. I bet you know the latest I'm not even going to use the name of a musician because I might not upset someone because it might be your favorite. <laughs> I bet you know the, the lyrics to the latest hit, whatever, whoever did it. <laughs> huh? I bet, I mean, you may not, but I bet you somebody in your mind. Somebody, on, maybe not in this house, maybe you on video. Amen. Why are you poking the video on this? Because it's easier than poking y'all. <laughs> 
But the word of the, the word of God, it's a language from a foreign land. I, I, I've got my app back up to learn Spanish. I've been working on Spanish for a long time. Guess what? I got a long way to go. <laughs> I got a large vocabulary, but I'm not fluent in it. You know what language I want to be fluent in? This language right here. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And it takes time. And it does. It takes work. I'm not trying to talk about working for your righteousness. I'm talking about working to understand the word of God. Yeah. To put the time in. Amen? All right. You get the point. Without truth, the Christian is being lied to, stolen from, and is about to be given a kill shot from the enemy. Can you put this scripture on the uh, screen for me, Haley? It's John chapter... <laughs> 17 verses 16 through 19. I wanted you to see this because I wanted to kind of break it down a little bit. It says, they are not of the world. This is Jesus speaking. This is his prayer to the Father. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying. He knows he's about to go to Jerusalem. He knows he's about to go to the cross. He's praying to the Father that the Father would take care of the disciples. All right? So he says, they, the disciples, are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So let's slow down for a second. Let's remember, he said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. And then he said, I sanctify myself so that they might be sanctified through the truth. So let's start with the first one. Sanctify them through your truth. What, the word sanctify, y'all know what that means, right? Anybody want to holler it out there for me real quick? Make holy and set apart. Yes. <laughs> it brings like, you make holy and set apart. Amen. Because we say it a lot, right? Is it a problem to go over and over and over again? No. See, I don't know about you, but I want this stuff in my heart, in my head. I want to know this. To be made holy and to be set apart. I shouldn't have had that too. That, that A is supposed to really be part of so I think it's all one word, right? Yeah. So, what I, want, what I want to tell you is, is this. Just imagine a world full of people. Now, they're all broken. They're crooked because they were born of Adam. Right? I didn't plan on doing this, but I'm doing it. And if I was going to put a bunch of eyes, I'm not going to do it, but you get it. They got the cross-eyed thing because you know what? They're dead. Because born in Adam, they're dead to the presence of God. Born in Adam, our sinful nature is ruling and reigning, and we don't know God. And we're, we've got scoliosis. There's a scripture that I've told y'all that before. Our crooked and perverse generation, the word is scoliosis. That's where we get the word scoliosis. I've told y'all that many times. So we're broken right, in, in Adam. But then God sends Jesus. Hallelujah. And this is his crown of thorns. You get the point. And God sends Jesus, and then... Jesus does his work on the cross, right? And he resurrects from the dead. And then the word of God goes forth with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit rides upon the word of truth and begins to stimulate the heart of man. It's called conviction. Conviction is a good thing. Condemnation is a bad thing. Conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's his job, is to convict the world and to show the world sin. Because God doesn't like sin. Because it makes the bird bad dirty. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want to hang out there. So when you hear the word of God. And you hear the word of God preach. And then let's just say this person here. He's the one we never thought would have got saved right here. He was really, really bad. Okay. But he heard the word. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit yeah. did what the Holy Spirit does and started to penetrate his heart. And he's laying down in bed in bed at night. He can't he's tossing and turning. He can't get the words that maybe Elena said to him or Callie or Robert. He can't get the word out of his head because if you told him about Jesus and then you went home and there you prayed for his soul. Oh, oh, oh now they're having trouble. Now they can't sleep. Oh, the voice of 
the Lord is dealing with them in their bed. And the Holy Spirit's convicted them. And then they do it. They do it. They did it. They said, Jesus, Jesus, won't you save me? And whenever they said it, oh, hallelujah, translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, moved from death to life, new life, Born again, that's the word of God. And if it hadn't happened to you yet, you need to cry out to Jesus because you really, really want yeah, yeah, what yeah. I'm trying to talk to you about. Amen. Amen. Sanctified, separated, separated from what? From the world. Mm. To be made holy. How was I made holy? Because now you're in Christ. Mm. Hallelujah. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. People are sitting in churches all over the place. They're looking to fill their empty spots. And many times they're being fed a diet of watered down milk. I'm not using nobody's name. I don't have to use nobody's name. That's right. It's out there. They're being fed a diet of watered down milk. And you know what happens? God's people become anemic. Mm. See, the word of God does for the downtrodden what iron does for anemia. Mm. Oh, yeah, let me tell you something. <clears throat> you know what anemia means? It means you don't have enough red blood cells. If you don't have enough red blood cells, you don't have enough hemoglobin. If you don't have enough hemoglobin, you can't carry oxygen. If you can't carry oxygen to your cells, you become weak and fatigued. That's why women that have anemia are always like, I feel so tired. And the doctor pulls her little eyelid down. Well, I think you're anemic. You need some iron. A Christian without the word of God is like a, a spiritual anemia. They don't, they, they, don't, they don't know. And that's what happens. A diluted gospel for a person that's sitting in a church and, and, and hearing a diluted gospel, they don't know what sin is. If they don't know what sin is, they don't know what it means to repent. And then they, if there's no repentance, the, the, the word of God says, with repentance, there's refreshing. Yeah. With repentance, there's refreshing. That's what it says in Acts chapter 3. Peter said, with repentance, there's refreshing. And if you look up the word, it means like, it's like a cooling. It's a revival. There's a revival that takes place in the heart. Okay, I'm going to call upon some of y'all's memory. Y'all remember when we went out to the lake and Naya sang some songs and Bill and, uh, who else? Somebody helped him barbecue. And we went out there and we did some barbecue. We carried the cross around a little bit. But remember Naya sang some songs? Y'all remember what happened while we were singing? Y'all don't even remember, huh? That cold, that cold wind. Huh? That cold wind. That cold wind came through there. That cold wind started blowing off the lake the Lord. Oh, man. Hallelujah, cool and refreshing. The other day I was jogging. Sometimes I do this. Some people think it's gross because I go back to work like that. But I'm not trying to get a date. I got a wife. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not trying to get my exercise. And I need some help. I'm jogging at lunchtime. But this time I got my little AirPods in. And I'm worshiping the Lord. And I think she's singing that Jesus song. <laughs> and I'm like, Lord, you're so good. I can't thank you enough. I work. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes that cold wind. I'm not trying to say, I don't know. I, look, the sun was still out. And all of a sudden, this cold wind started blowing. And I couldn't help but think about it because, see, with repentance comes refreshing. When the truth of God's word is preached and the Holy Spirit begins to convict and touch our hearts, he's revealing to us the things in our life that he doesn't like. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's not trying to condemn you. Yeah, he's making you trying to make you feel bad so that you'll get right. And then you'll repent to him. And then you'll come clean with him. And then when you do that, hallelujah, he's going to bring refreshing and revival to your heart and lift you up and heal you. Now, you know, I wanted to share this with you real quick. I, he says, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through truth. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm like one of these guys that are like, what does that mean? Like, what you trying to say, Jesus, you weren't sanctified? That's not what he's saying. There's about to be a transition in Jesus' life. He's about to become altogether separate from common man. He was already separate from common man because he had no sin in him. But he's about to become glorified. He's about to separate himself from the rest of the world and that he's going to be the firstborn from the dead. 
He's about to go to the cross and die, and then he's going to be resurrected. And when he gets resurrected, he's going to receive a glorified body. Hallelujah. And with that glorified body, he's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father and ever live to make intercession for you. So the truth is going to be right there making intercession for you. And because of his position of truth now at the right hand of the Father, you now can be sanctified. Because he said this, he said, I pray to you, Father, that you would send the other comforter. Amen. And Jesus told his disciples, he says, it's expedient. It's a good thing that I go. For if I do not go, he will not come. And he will bring all truth. He will take up what is mine. He will show it unto you. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit wants to bring Sanctification in your life. Amen. Let's look at a couple of these scriptures. Psalm chapter 119, 9 through 11. It's titled, this little verse, these little verses right here are titled death, which is the letter B having to do with the Hebrew language. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. The word afflicted means to be browbeaten. You ever feel browbeaten sometimes? Like, you know, really. I mean, sometimes you walk, like, I don't know about you, but I was like, dude, why am I feeling all hunched over like that? Why am I feeling all down? No, 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 no. I said it Wednesday, but look, I'm not going to repeat it, but look, I am afflicted. I feel browbeaten. But look what the psalmist said. Quicken me, O Lord, according to your word. Yeah. That word quicken, old King James language, it means come to life. Mm. Give me, give me life, Lord. Refresh me. Hallelujah. So you're on a journey in the land of lies and you will not make it to your intended destination without his truth. And the belt of truth secures righteousness in its right place. <laughs> Having on the breastplate of righteousness. We're transitioning out to righteousness. All right. You know, the breastplate of righteousness is supposed to be right here. And it's protecting your vital organs. Physically, this spot right here is called the mediastinum. I'm not trying to, you don't have to remember none of this. I'm just trying to tell you something. It contains your heart and all the great vessels. Branching off of your heart is the aorta, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, your bronchial tubes. What is your point, preacher? So you're teaching us anatomy and physiology? No, I'm about to tell you this. Because if you take a shot with a hollow point in your mediastinum, my friend, you ain't making it out of that without a miracle. That's right. Because everything. You need it right there. Right. The most vital spot of your spiritual life is your heart. Mm -hmm. The word of God says in First Peter says this. See, the enemy wants to give you a kill shot. He's aiming for your heart. It's your vital organ. It's the place of fellowship between you and God. And in 1 Peter 3.15, he said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The heart is the place that belongs to Jesus. And the enemy wants to steal it from the Lord. He wants to fill that spot with unrighteousness. And Jesus does not want to live in unrighteousness. Is it okay if I say that? Because I'm preaching to myself. Jesus does not want to live in a place of unrighteousness. He is loving. He is kind. He is long-suffering. He's merciful. But Jesus don't want to live in a pig pen. And he won't stay there forever. That's right. He will not stay there forever. That's right. But he's so good. He's so good that you'll think that he left you. And that's exactly when he's going to show up and heal you. Amen. That's Jesus. Uh, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's talk a little bit about righteousness. Psalm 110. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of what? Say it. Melchizedek. Here we go. Y'all ready for this word? Melchizedek. Kids at that. I know I do this a lot. Some people are like, why is this guy coming up with all these crazy words? Because half of y'all been here for 10 years and I done did this 15 times. <laughs> so yeah, I never even heard of Melchizedek. Hang around, my friend, because guess what? You're going to learn about him and guess what? You're going to be introduced to him today. Not just real quick. Melchizedek. 
What is the point? Can you put that scripture up there? Did I even give it to you? What is it? It's Psalm chapter, Psalm 110, verse 4. And that way you could be looking at that. Somebody read that to me. What does it say again? Somebody? No? I'll read it. Lord, That's not up there. Huh? I'm going to read. Go ahead. Uh, verse 4. Yes. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are. Oh, yeah, unfortunately. Oh, oh, yeah, it's a good, I'll, I'll finish. It will not repent. The Lord has sworn, will not repent. You are a priest after forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melk, what does that mean? Y'all remember? King. Zedek. Righteous. What that psalm is talking about, I'm not even going to read the other scriptures because it's, just taking, it's going to take too much time. But what that psalm is talking about is that there was a man named Melchizedek. That was his name, Melchizedek. And he was the king of a place called Salem, which was ancient Jerusalem. Jerusalem means peace. There's only three spots in the Bible that mentions Melchizedek. Genesis, where he meets Abraham. Psalms, where the psalmist talks about him. And the book of Hebrews. And what it says is that Melchizedek, his name means King of righteousness. And he ruled and presided over a city called peace. So he's the king of righteousness and he's the king of peace. What we're talking about now is righteousness. And I want you to know the scripture says in Romans chapter 3 verse 21 that now the righteousness of God has been revealed. See, in the Old Testament, God's righteousness was revealed through the law. And now Paul is saying, now the righteousness of God has been revealed and it's been witnessed to us through the law and the prophets. Meaning the Bible was telling us that God's righteousness was coming, but now it's here. And guess what his name is? Jesus. Jesus. His name is Jesus. God's righteousness is a person and his name is Jesus. And the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus, the righteous one of God, took his righteousness and paid the sin penalty for you and for me. He took his righteousness and laid it upon the cross because we were unrighteous. Because born in Adam, we were born in sin. And now when the gospel is told, and this little fellow right here, here's that story. <clears throat> and believes with his heart. Another one. Saved out of the clutches yes. of Satan's bottom hole. Hallelujah. He's righteousness. Jesus is the righteous one. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which would receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life by one Jesus Christ. Righteousness is a gift. Righteousness is a person. But his righteousness is given to us as a gift. You know one of the beautiful things about a gift is this. Don't you like, I mean a lot of people like getting gifts. Especially if it's something you like. Right? I mean, it might feel weird if it's something that you didn't like. But, but if, you got, if it's something you like, isn't it beautiful? <coughs> well, you know what the very meaning of a gift is that it didn't cost you anything. Yeah. But you know, anytime somebody gives a gift, more than likely somebody paid something for it. Jesus gives us the gift of his righteousness, but he purchased the ability to give that righteousness to us yes. through the shedding of his blood. Yes. He gave his life. So it was a high price for you to get that righteousness. Amen. It's a high price for you to get that gift. Revelation 19 says this. In the King James, it says, and to her, talking about the bride, was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. But I want you to, I want you to know that the, that the NASB and some other literal translations say it different. And this is very consistent with the word of God. Let me tell you what it says. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. Bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. There is a righteousness given to the saint as a gift from Jesus when he died on the cross, 
And there is a righteous life lived by the saints through grace from the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between him giving us his righteousness and us through the grace that's given to us through his righteousness living a righteous life. But good news, God's called us to righteous living, but he's also empowered us to be able to live a righteous life. We just need a little bit more want to, amen? amen? From the help of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the Word of God is clear that God is expecting us to live our lives righteously and powered by the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about peace a little bit. Verse 15 of what we were reading says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That word shod kind of stuck out to me when I was studying. So I want you to know, you may not all be able to see it, but in the Greek, if you were going to write this word shod, it would be something like this. Hupo, and then the word is air. Okay? Hupo air. If you were going to spell it in English, it would be like this. Hupo dare. Now, I'm not trying to be overly technical. You don't have to memorize Greek words. Come on, man. We're not really trying to teach college here. Sometimes, sometimes people do it. If I lose you because I told you a Greek word, then I am failed you. I'm trying to make a point. Greek words are, are, are many times compound words. Y'all remember when we learned that in the fifth grade? Y'all remember that? Compound words, two words brought together? Yeah. Okay. It's not that even Aubrey remembers compound <laughs> words. Okay, so come on. Give me a break. <laughs> All right. Well, in the Greek language, the prefix is oftentimes a preposition. This preposition, hupo, means under. So the word shod literally has something to do with underneath. So when you shod your feet, something's going on the underneath side. See, back in the ancient days, they wore sandals. See, whenever you talk about a shod versus an unshod horse, here's an illustration. Wild horses wear their hooves down gradually as they move from place to place over hard, arid terrain. However, domesticated horses work harder, will often wear down their hooves more quickly than they would out in the wild. Horse shoes shod the underneath and add durability and strength. The point to the illustration is this, to emphasize the underneath part. Because see, when you shod your feet with the gospel of peace, you're no longer walking on a fallen earth. Mm, Come on, good. somebody. Help me out. That's good right there. You're no longer walking on this fallen earth. There's something between you and this sinful earth that you're on. It's the gospel of peace. And Jesus is your Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. See, we're not supposed to be walking on the earth and letting the lies of Satan grab a hold of us. We're supposed to be having our feet shod with the gospel of peace. The believer is supposed to be walking on peace. Amen. Romans 5, 1 says this. Therefore, being justified by faith, what? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you can't have peace in your walk or in your life until you have peace with God. And that's what this scripture is talking about. The unbeliever is not at peace with God. Put this on, up on the screen for me, please. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Romans 8, verse 7. We're getting near the end. Just bear with me. It's only 1130. I'm going to have you out of here before 12, depending on how long you want to worship the Lord. All right? <laughs> Romans 8, verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. I want you to hear that word enmity because it's older, outdated language. But the idea is, is that it's in, it, you're an enemy. The idea of the word is hostility. James 4.4 4 says this. You don't even have to turn there because they, they don't want to see this one anyway. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Oh, preacher, that seems so hard. Why did you have to do that one? No, really, I mean, there's a whole book you could have turned to. Why did you pick that one? Because it's true. We need it. Yes. Don't you think that's the type of scripture that some pastors would pass over? I mean, listen, there's been times that I'm reading the Bible. I'm going to be real. I'm over here reading the Bible, and there's things in my life, too. 
He's like, what are you doing? Go back. Yeah. And I want you to preach it. Because I'm trying to get a hold of you, boy. If you don't look at my people in the face, you're going to preach my word. I'm going to deal with you, son. Come on, man. Preach. Let the word of God be the truth. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Why did you settle on that one? Because enmity means hostility, and hostility is an antonym of peace. Talking about peace with God. When a man or woman is justified, made righteous in the eyes of God through faith in Jesus' sacrifice, they've been made right with God, and now they have peace with God. And once you have peace with God, you can have peace in your life, peace in your walk with God. Yes. Amen? Yes. That's what Philippians 4, 7 says. Philippians 4, verse 7 says, And the peace of, of God. See, first you got to have peace with God. Once you have peace with God, huh? Yes. then you're going to have the peace of of God, Amen. right? You're going to be peace with God first. First of all, you need to understand something. Jesus died and he gave you access to peace. Amen. But if you and I choose to live outside of his peace, there's going to be symptoms. It's a fancy medical word. Symptomatology. There's going to be symptomatology. Symptoms going on in your life where it's not peace. Amen. It's chaos. Amen. Confusion. Hostility, irritation, arguments, yelling, strife, division. Why? Yeah. Because you're living outside yes. of the peace yes. of God. Amen. You're living according to your own. You're doing your own thing. You're not following the word of God. As much as possible is within you. Live what? Peaceably with all men. But that's going to require humility on my part, Lord. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You, we got to learn how to humble ourselves, all right? Philippians 4, 7 says this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yes. You know what? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> if all of your life, you're used to, say, for instance, with your wife or your husband or a friend or a family member. Let's say all of your life, there's a person in your life that knows how to press your button. <clears throat> Y'all know what I'm talking about? And, and every single time, you know it's going to happen, dude, right? Thanksgiving's around. right no, it ain't really that close. But I'm just saying, the next time you're around that person, you know it's going to happen. You ought to be prayed up ready because you know they going to press that button. And as soon as they press it, what happens? You feel it. Oh, them little creepy things running around, right? And the frustration and the confusion. You know what a proverb says? A soft answer turns away back. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, you want to disarm the devil. You want to, you want to watch the devil look like a silly little school dark kid. And he's over there working his little satanic magic, trying to cause all this conjure up, all this mess and all this stuff. And that person goes, put out a pressure button. And then the next thing you know, and, and, you, and listen, don't be playing no games with the Holy Ghost. Don't be trying to like throw some kind of something out there, but you ain't really humble in your heart. And you and you like, well, bless God, brother. <laughs> that don't work. All holier than thou. No, 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 no. That is self righteousness. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit doesn't respond to that. That's right. But you give it the real stuff, and you give that soft answer, and you watch what happens. Because I haven't seen it happen before. I'm talking about throttle down, change the whole atmosphere. I don't have time to go into this whole illustration, but man, I, when I was working, doing a lot more work for Rob and them, I sold a roof. And I'm telling you, this guy was trying to wiggle out of that deal. And I was doing my best. And he wasn't right because he signed, he signed a contract. Okay, and right is right. Okay, but look, look, I'm just trying to use it as a deal. He's trying to wiggle out of this deal. And, and I'm doing my best to explain the process. I already explained it. I had explained it so many times. You can ask Rob. If one thing Matt did, he explained stuff. And he's still trying to, and they're like, and then I get irritated. And I can feel it rising up. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, a soft answer turns me around. And I said, sir, ma'am, you know what's going on here? 
I'm doing a horrible job of explaining this. I wasn't. I was doing a great job for the first time. Nevertheless, Holy Spirit, and you know what? The whole thing changed. Praise God. They ended up getting blessed in the end more than one way. And I got blessed, and everybody got blessed. But you know, that's the thing. Sometimes but our pride doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth, my friend. I know I'm going along, but you got to hear me. Our pride doesn't want to do that. But if we're going to work with the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be working on our own. Come on. Yeah. Now, if you want God to start working in your heart and in your life, you need to start working according to the word of the Lord. And that requires humility. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. Yeah. Praise God. He'll do it. Amen. So now they have peace with God, amen, and we can have the peace of God. All right, I'm closing. Singers, musicians, come forward. I want to encourage you this morning. I don't give a whole lot of altar calls because, I don't know, I guess I'm scared y'all aren't going to come. <laughs> well, and you know what? I'm getting past on myself, my friend, because I want to give you an opportunity to activate faith. See, maybe you walking in here and you're like, you know what? I believe in the belt of truth. I believe in the breastplate of righteousness. I believe that my feet need to be shot in the gospel of peace. But I don't know that I've been walking that way. Well, guess what? You can go to the Lord. You can go to the Lord. And sometimes maybe a good place to do it is at the altar. Sometimes you'd rather do it at your house. I don't really care where you do it. I really don't. I promise you. I did that. That part doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that if something in this message spoke to you, and, and that you would bring it to the Lord, right? That you would go to the Lord and you would say, Lord, that part right there really hit me. And I'm asking you to do something in me. And if you'll do that, I promise you, the Holy Spirit will start to do His work. One last thing I want to talk to you about peace, though, whenever they get ready to worship. Lead us in worship is Philippians, Ephesians, 2 Corinthians, and 2 Peter. Maybe more, but for sure those four. Start their letter by saying this, grace and peace to you. Because yeah. I want you to know something. Where there is grace, there is peace. Yeah. You know, no wonder there are so many believers lacking peace in their lives. The world is filled with all kinds of trouble. And God's people really don't read the word that tells them that friendship with the world is hostility to God. It's, it's got to be a sad thing because, you know, a lot of times preachers don't want to talk about that part because it might offend someone and they might not want to come back next week. I hope you come back next week. I really do because I get sad when I don't see you. But I got to tell you something. I'm going to remind you something. And then I promise you I'm going to let them do their thing. Back in 2001, after my sister had taken her life, before 9-11, somewhere in between those two events, I was in a bar room. I had fallen back. I had not been in a bar room in 12 years. I know you've heard the story, but it's fresh in my heart right now. And in that bar room, in the bathroom, in the stall, was two guys at a latrine. And one guy telling the other guy, my old lady left me, life stinks. Out of nowhere. In that place that smelled bad, that was full of uncleanness and unrighteousness, the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart. He said, listen to them, son. They need me. They all need me. And look at you. Can you use you? You've always been willing to tell people about me, but only in a way that you can still look for me. No, you will lay your life down before me, and you will present my word for the way that it is written and that I will use you. See, I got to work for him, my friend. I've been given a mandate by God. I don't mean to get emotional, but to present this word for the way he wrote it. I will admit to you that sometimes it doesn't come out of me maybe the way that the Lord would want it. So what I would ask you is please pray for me. Please pray for me that the way that delivery comes is the way the Holy Spirit wants it to come. But I do know this. I've been reading this Bible. I've been studying it. And he's teaching me some things. And I know this. I want to present it for the way that it's written. Because I believe it's going to give you hope. And it'll give you life. And it'll do that for other people. Amen. Let's give glory to our King this morning. Hallelujah.